Look, for as long as this Andor fellow is going to keep getting in all kinds of fantastical trouble, we are just going to keep having to talk about it. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insight into the creative process of storytelling. And folks, Tony Gilroy is back. That's right. The head writer, the showrunner of Andor on Disney Plus is here with us today to talk through some of the bigger moments in episodes five through nine in season one. And I got to tell you, this is one of the few shows that I stay current with week by week, and it's totally worth it. I absolutely adore this show. The writing is so good. In today's episode, we jump right to it. So there is no spoiler alert except for what I'm telling you right now. We are talking in depth about episodes five through nine of season one. So if you have not seen those episodes, they will be spoiled for you. So I would press pause and go watch them before listening to this episode. But look, Tony Gilroy does not disappoint. He has a great sense of his characters and where the show is going and was very forthcoming about what it took to get episodes five through nine in the can. So I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, Backstory Magazine turns 10. That's right. We survived a decade and we couldn't have done it without your help. If you have never read us before, you can, of course, test drive us over at Backstory.net and read the free issue, or you could use the iPad app backstory where you could read the free issue there as well. And if you like what you see, and I hope you do, you could consider becoming a subscriber. And to sweeten the deal, I want to give you discount coupon code SAVE5. That will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. The code will work at backstory.net and you enter it there in your checkout cart, but it'll give you access to both backstory.net and the iPad app as well. So, you know, it's two for one. You get access to both easily. But look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube channel, which is all the Zoom cast go of these interviews. So you could see us do the interviews. You don't have to just hear us, but it would really mean a lot to me to have you subscribe to my passion project. So thanks for considering. But now without any further ado, let's jump right into our interview with writer and showrunner Tony Gilroy to chat about Andor season one, episodes five through nine. I think the easiest way to start is, you know, Again, I love these episodes, and it's a show that just gets better with every episode, which is fantastic. I just want to talk about something that's a real big accomplishment for the show, just to kind of start off for a second. I was I was seven and a half years old when I saw Star Wars, and a lot of the political mechanizations in the movie, they went right over my head. But I couldn't turn away from the screen because I knew I was in a room where the adults were speaking. So I wanted to know what happened. Nobody was talking down. Nobody was being dumb. And you did that just beautifully again all throughout this show. And I kind of want to liken it for more recent memory of, of the conversation of Scott Frank's The Queen's Gambit, in which you talk about a show that, oh, it's about chess. That's a niche audience. No one's going to watch that. But the chess was the icing on the cake, but they never talked down about it. They used obscure references. They used correct terminology. They never dumb down their chess. And Star Wars is a different league because you're getting into something that it really is four quadrants. OK, it's young to old, but there is a younger audience. And I'm curious if you ever encountered I don't think that you would encounter pushback, but just like a hesitation point of are we getting too much political stuff in here? Because you never shy away from it. And to have a show that's truly about the beginning of a political rebellion, you have to have it. But I could see there being serious conversations you guys had about when's too much or when's too little. I'm the audience. I mean, I'm writing for myself. I, I don't I'm trying to think if I've ever really I mean, I've come on rewrites for things and maybe I've shifted my I don't know, my my lens somewhat. But by and large, I write what I think is I want to see what I'm interested in. I've never really I, I, I'm sure along the way I, you know, I mean, just as we started, because it was such a long foreplay. To, to actually green lighting this. I mean, and I mean, seriously green lighting. It was all kinds of incremental steps along the way. But I wrote one, two, and three, I think. I wrote, certainly wrote one, and yeah, I wrote one, two, and three pretty much that first tranche, probably before I got paid, probably before we even hit the, you know, before we hit the writer's room. And I, you know, 
that was a litmus test for everybody. It was it interesting to me? Uh, is Disney going to go for this? Is Lucasfilm going to be able to integrate this with the other material? Is this what everybody's interested in? So, I mean, you know, those first three episodes are pretty, um, you know, I start in a brothel and I and I have a, you know, a pretty intense scene at the top and it, it doesn't relent after there. So the appetite on the other end of the, on the bottom, you know, for, for Disney and Lucasfilm, I think there there's a desperation to open up other lanes. You have this really large, you know, beautiful, juicy property with all these potentials for it. And the aspiration is to open up another lane. So I thought along the way, this is probably pretty challenging. I mean, someone brought a, uh, we had the premiere in LA and a friend of mine was bringing his grandson. I said, well, how old is he? He's nine. I go, man, it's going to be, you know, see, it's tough. You know, it's it's right on the edge. So I'm writing it for myself. I'm writing it for me. Always. What would the would the grandkid think of it? I think he was kind of pinned by. I mean, look, yeah, I don't know if it, the whole event and everything. I didn't really get a really. I don't really. Yeah. I, I I'd be pretending if I said that I really knew what was going on. He's very polite and everything, but I don't really know. In film terms, this would be a PG-13 film, and I think it's okay to make films for teens and above. And I I think teens and above could understand this because. They're, they're not going to understand every move of it, but but I think it's a perfectly placed thing. And I and you said about opening other lanes. It's imperative. It's imperative to make to make sci fi genre content for adults, just like when in the OOs after 9-11 Battlestar Galactica was relaunched. Yeah. And it had political overtones because yeah. that's where we were in the world. And it didn't talk down and it wasn't a goofy show. No, but they, but that was controversial for their audience too. I know it, it, it wasn't cute. My son was way into that show. And I remember what it was like, wow, what you're doing is great because it's so important to have this political theme be a part of star Wars. And it's always been in it. And it's just, it's just being developed on a fantastical level. Now I, I'm curious, you know, something that you said in our last interview about working with the Lucas story group and handling Canon, you said that you realized you could figure out your own way to change that, you know, Canon had the wrong planet listed for Cassian, you know, because you could you could change it that, of course, he's a scoundrel. He's he needs to hide out. I'm curious in episodes five through nine, which is what we're talking about today, because those are the ones that are out. Were there other little Canon quirks like that in which there were little things that you're like, oh, yeah, we could do this and we could take this to mean that. Well, obviously, Mon Mothma's inner life and, and backstory is completely. Oh, yeah, that would be a major one. I'm trying to think if there's anything that's canonical that we turn around in any way. I guess also the same thing with Mon Mothma. I mean, they don't there's no description of her family life. So making Val her cousin and, and having Perrin and Leda, her daughter and, and doing that no i don't think there's anything i don't think that comes to mind specifically now no. yeah and and i'll and i'll get back to mon mothman in, in, in a second you know another thing from last time that was great to hear was about the writer's room being a passionate place for gladiatorial combat where ideas were were barraged at each other and best idea wins and that you know that only works if there's no ego you know and, and people can accept when an idea that's not there. i don't think that's true I don't yeah. think it's an exemption of ego. You have to sometimes you have to manufacture ego and manufacture confidence to be to be writing well. Sometimes you have to really fake it and push yourself in that way. It's not that. It's it's um, it's just a lot of experience of the uselessness of wasting time. It's three people in that room that don't care. You're not going to hurt anybody's feelings in that room. You're not going to. There's nobody. Nobody's going to get triggered by anything that anybody says in that room. The only thing that's going to trigger anybody is if a bad idea lasts too long, because everybody knows that a bad idea that lasts too long is time wasted and you've chased something down. So it's actually you want ego in the room, but you don't want insecurity. You know, sure. that's what you don't want. They don't have to be paired. So it's yeah, it's a lack of insecurity that you want to have and you want to have everybody be open-minded, but I, you want everybody to feel like to bring it, to be strong about it, to feel absolutely. Confident. And, and really all I meant is the, the rooms that I've heard about where it doesn't work is when ego plays with somebody not letting go of their idea and seeing it. Well, as dude, you can see that you don't need a room to see that. You can see that everywhere you go. I mean, I know the worst people, the collaborator with the, the people that, you know, don't have many ideas. And every time they do have an idea, they think it's like a hallowed ground or something. And you're like, what? and they like, my God, I had an idea. And you're like, well, we had, there should be a thousand ideas every day. Like we'll pick yeah. the good one, but they know this is my idea. You yeah, know, those are the people that, those are the people that you really have to stay away from. What was something Holly debated in episodes five through nine? I mean, literally be the, the practicalities of, you know, I think she should do this. What if she does that? And, and they do this and they go, they, no, 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 no. They can't do that because of this. And, you know, and it's literally, it's carpentry. It's the carpentry arguments about where, you know, what kind of nails should we use here? And what kind of two by four goes here? And what kind of floorboards here? And I, what, it's, 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 um, it's plotting. 
it's really most of it is, and the hardest part of this show really in the end is the plotting, you know, to, to make all this plot for 700, 600, 700 pages of plot with all these people and have it all tie together and have it all be cause and effect and work out time-wise. And there's no easy way to do that. That is that is hammer and tong all the way through. Speaking of structure, do you see these episodes five through nine as basically your act two? If one through four was act one and that's why you chose? I don't think, of, I never, I don't think of any, I never think about it that way. I so never think about So it. you don't have a series arc in your mind of, of, of movements like that, act one, act two, act three for the finale here. It, it laid out that way because Disney wanted to do 12 and then we had this director schedule and it, and it kind of laid out. We don't lay out perfectly. One, two, and three obviously are of a piece. Four, five, and six are obviously a kind of mini movie. Seven yeah. is kind of an odd little odd duck in the middle. Uh, eight, nine, and 10 are a unit. 11 and 12 are another, you know, they're their own pair. It's interesting because as much as I don't like to think or try to think about the show that way, because this is a script conversation, I found now because I'm so, all I do is freaking write anymore. I find myself very uh, clear on my process. I have, I have a bunch of crescendo set pieces, um, like say the end of three, where everybody's in motion and all these different things are happening and you have a lot of timing issues and where is everybody at that moment and who knows what. Rather than waste time pushing myself around for uh, hours or days trying to figure out that ultimately what I get to is I have to chapter it. So I do get very organized and very chaptery about writing sequences and about writing sections. I'm like, oh, I got to break it down. If I name this, if I name this chapter, if I name this piece, I can do that. So I get very organized and mac micro about that stuff. I've never once, I mean, I, I've been in meetings where, you know, I'll talk, you'll talk about your script, the second act or the third act, just because it's a, it's a common parlance, but I've never used any of those things when I sit down to do this. You know, I never, that's not you. Fair enough. Obviously, a rebellion needs funding. And so in this, you know, first part of these episodes, you have the the perfect robbery planned. And I would just like to hear about the evolution of it. You know, and, and if you always started with the concept of stealing imperial wages from a garrison, or if there were other iterations that, that led you there. No, I think the economics of all this is it looked like a completely fertile territory that hadn't really been explored in Star Wars at all. I mean, all of the economics. I mean, where does all the materiel come for the Empire? Where do they get all this stuff? How do they build Scarif and Edo and all these ships and how it pays for it? And, where does it come from? All that stuff. I mean, you know, Kevin Smith was joking about what the, the janitors and the Death Star, right, and clerks, but it's like, it's real. It's like, how does the economy work? So I'm always interested in that. Revolutions are expensive. I mean, pick your revolution. Pick the Haitian Revolution or the French Revolution or the or the Roman the Roman Revolution. Or there's an amazing book uh, called Young Stalin, where the opening uh, chapter of the book is an incredibly cinematic, huge, long description of this massive heist in a Georgian Russian town with a stagecoach robbery. And it's run by Stalin when he's like 19 years old. And Stalin was the guy, why did Lenin love Stalin so much? Because he was the thief. He was a financier. He brought money. A lot of other people, Trotsky didn't bring in any money. He was right. talking all the time and helping people and giving great speeches. But when it, when the rubber meets the road, what do you need? I got to, I need bullets. I need food. So I knew we had to do that. And, and, uh, it's good. Was it, 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 was it always a heist of Imperial wages from a garrison or did you have other heists that you originally considered? No, I think we, no, I think that was, I think we wanted to confront the, uh, we wanted something that was a spectacular poke in the eye because it's not just, you know, that's why episode seven is so important. That's why it's called an announcement. And that's what, what Dedra says in that scene is really true. All these people are treating it like a robbery. But it's not. It's really an announcement. It's, it is to get the money, but it is. It's if you think of Luthen Rail as a founder of a company in a way. He's been building something in his garage all these years, and now they're going to take it out into the street for the first yeah. time. It's interesting because it is inherent, not in all, but in a lot of heist movies, to have that outside distraction that the thieves plan around. And your episode, The Eye, has the natural occurring once a year event of The Eye. That is distracting everyone. Once every three uh, years, Jeff. Once every three years. Pardon me. Pardon me. Every three years, <laughs> which, which, which which distracts people. Don't show up next year because it won't be there. You got to wait two years. I'm going to wait two years. But so, but so, you know, in other heist films, it's New Year's Eve. You know, all the bedlam right. of New Year's Eve. There's yeah, yeah, yeah. A parade no, absolutely. going on outside that they go oh, into yeah. the parade. So, so when did the idea of this event, the eye, come about? And it looked absolutely beautiful, and it made it hard for their getaway to fly into it as well, which was again great. I mean, obviously, in designing the heist, you're absolutely correct. I mean, a distraction is 
particularly says it's a, it's asymmetrical warfare, isn't it? It's 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 a small band of idiots, you know, trying to trying to try to go up against a hugely fortified uh, military base. One of the things that interests me also, we talked about the economics of Star Wars not being really that developed. You see how much ethnography and cultural depth we put into the places that we go, how deeply culturally deep we go in Ferrix and Aldani. We're going to keep doing that. But another thing that I felt was low-hanging fruit was there really wasn't much of the natural world in Star Wars. There wasn't much. There wasn't anything that was... Like people weren't responding to the beauty sometimes of what was around them or the natural world in a way. I think that was in my mind. And the idea that there was this astronomical event. And I asked Pablo, I said, have they ever done anything? No, they've never done anything like that. And that just seemed, I don't know, it just seemed really cool. You know, we put that on the table and there's nothing like writing, oh, it's the most remarkable fucking thing you've ever seen coming over the horizon. I mean, everybody loves to read that on the page. <laughs> and so <laughs> the conversations with uh, Mo and Leo, who's our visual effects supervisor, and TJ Falls, who's his producer, those conversations, uh, that was a, a year and a half long project to get that to where we wanted it. I mean, you have some of the best effects on television, hands down. Well, I'm telling you, man, Mo and Leo, Leo and TJ Falls and the people, they were on Rogue, so they've been with us all the way through Rogue. Yeah. I mean, if you look at what Moen does and you think about it, it's not just delivering the visual effects and making them be seamless, but the taste that you get from, I mean, you could have someone who could just churn out incredible visual effects and they could be absolutely fantastic and they could be on budget and they could be on time and, and all the vendors would be happy. But a lot of those shots are being made by that team. And so it's their taste and how are they framing it? And Moen makes sure that everything that we do looks like it came from a camera. We don't ever have a visual effect that doesn't have a potential camera position or a lens to it. It looks like it comes from us, you know, and that's, you see a lot of films where they just don't care. It's like, oh, we can do this and we can do this and we can do this. Well, whose perspective is it? What is it? Whose point of view is that? How does that, what's the book? What's the grammar of that? So he's so ingrained with the grammar or the visual grammar of our show. And he's got such great taste. And like, you know, the shot with a, People love that shot. They put it in all the trailers where the TIE fighter pilots are coming down, descending down into the into the ships, right? Yeah. To take off after the Eye of Aldani. And, and I saw people, like, people were, you know, oh my God. And I've seen people tweet about it and whatever. I never saw that shot until until a rough draft of it was presented to me in a visual effects review. And you go like, oh my God, let's have that. I mean, that's Moen. Very talented. That's, uh, that's Very a team good. effort. Okay, you have all the resources of Lucasfilm. You, you have a, a well-funded show on Disney+. Plus. You're 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 going, you know, as a prequel to Rogue One, a movie that people love. You could have made this a little easier for yourself, sir. But I respect <laughs> oh, shit, the fact man. that you didn't. And you you pulled a hat trick that I really want to lean into for a second. That is not easy. There is there is an adage. OK, and I and I believe that William Goldman correctly said nobody knows anything. There are there should not be rules. You could invent them on your own. But there is an adage that most people adhere to of it gets really tricky introducing a lot of new characters in the middle of something in the in the middle of something and then especially in the third act here in this in these episodes that we're talking about five through nine these four episodes you have the episodes that include the acts who were digging deeper into the team that's being assembled for the heist so we have a whole new group of people to meet after we've just had the world building episodes of one through four and then when he's sent to prison, you again have a whole new group of people to meet. And it works absolutely perfectly because the show remains grounded with the Mon Mothma plot line, which is expanding. And right at the point when we think we've kind of forgotten about Bix, you throw her back in. Like, so your structure was saving you on that because we're returning to familiar things, but you're also continuing to world build that laid into a seasonal arc and I, I it was astounding i'm just curious what conversations you had about how much time to spend with learning about the heist team knowing that some of them are going to die with learning about uh you know the prisoners clearly because we had like 100 we have 190 speaking parts in the thing i mean if you ask donna wallenberg uh, she loves it. she she's like you know every time i turn a draft in or every time we push something forward if we have a problem usually the solution is a character or sometimes a new character um, I don't have any, I guess I don't have much trouble conjuring new people uh, as I need them. 
it is difficult to keep everybody, make sure you're taking proper attendance and not leaving anybody away too long. But then also there's times where you really do want to leave people and you want to have people forget about them. So when they come back and something's changed, it makes a difference. So there's there's that dynamic going on. There's also sometimes we have, you know, availability of how many how many episodes I can have a character in, you know, is economically, I mean, we don't have unlimited finances at all. And so where and when I can have people is sometimes an issue. I don't have any trouble bringing in new people. I, the scenes I don't want to write, the shit that everybody writer hates is, man, like I hate going, when you walk into the factory and you got to go to the table, introducing eight people, nine people at the who are arriving at the same time who have shit to say that's important and trying to make that look good on the page, feel like it's going to feel on the screen. That's a pain in the ass. That's hard to do. That I, nobody likes that. That does that never gets any easier. You ask any screenwriter, like, oh my god, okay, you got to do the, uh, you know, you got to do twelve angry men, and what do you do? Do you introduce them all at the top, or do you let them introduce them as they speak, or what do you do? You know, that's tough. You pulled it off great. They saved me. All these, all these characters. Give me an opportunity to, to move the story along, really. And what was interesting was, you know, you also had the the possible trope with Skeen at the end of the I episode in which is there honor amongst thieves, right? Like they're they're doing this for the political benefit of the rebellion. But Skeen tries to see if Cassian would take the money and run with him. Yeah, I think Skeen is ripping. I don't I've heard a theory that Skeen is actually testing him. But that is I, that is not our my intention. Skeen yeah, I, didn't, is, I didn't feel it was that way when I saw it. And Andor. Yeah again just pulls out his gun and shoots you know in a very unexpected fashion and i'm just well he did the math you know he's good at doing the math he did the math with the guy he did the math he's he's good at doing the math of what i have to do i mean i don't want to keep going that well too many times but he has to do it there's three times that we know he's done that how does this play out in the next in the next 20 minutes if i don't do this is that uh, always your capper for the scene was it always going to be that skeen's going to die as well definitely Again, on the money, follow the money, right? Like a good journalist. You know, Mon Mothma, as we're learning more about her, just for all the kids out there, we're really getting into bank laundering and how to properly, <laughs> you know, fund a rebellion. And so, you know, of course, our Angelin friends- banking code. Exactly. Let's yes, get into yes, that. Exactly. That's every nine year old's dream. It was mine. So, 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 I mean, like you're getting into these details that are just great about her needing to do this. And then the revelation that Val is quote unquote, another privileged rich girl self-described that's related to Mon Mothma. At what point did that connection come clear? That couldn't have been. I really wanted that early on because I really, I was always fascinated by the Batter Meinhof group, you know, and okay. Patty Hearst and that whole, that whole kind of thing. And, and the Batter Meinhof people and, and that whole thing, there's a lot of very wealthy kids that were into that into, and, and the Red Brigade, same sort of thing in the mix of that. It's a legit thing. It's something that people understand. It's something that feels right. The show is really, I mean, what's it? It's about becoming, right? It's really about the revolution becoming the revolution. It's about Cassian Andor becoming the guy who's going to become the guy at the end. It's about all these people becoming different things. But if you start everybody at the same gestation point or something, it would be really boring to watch everybody. Some people have have made some choices beforehand. So it's interesting to see the consequences of those decisions while other people are making decisions. So I just like the idea of I like the always like the idea. I didn't know I'm not sure if I had her as uh as as Mon's cousin when I first started, but I definitely had this batter Meinhof idea in my mind for the for the raid. Yeah. It was a great reveal. I mean, and and it's and it's fun to see them. Look, talk about characters. Another great reveal <laughs> is is Luthen sitting down with Sagarera. And and that was that was totally welcomed. At what point did you realize you were going to do that? And then finding out the function that he plays. So far, you know, they've only had one meeting in these first, you know, nine episodes that we're talking about. But it, it's very interesting. And it also shows another thing that's fantastic. Just before you answer that, I want to add to it because you did it greatly. Luthen has clashes with Mon Mothma. Saw has clashes with Luthen. You're not showing a happy-go-lucky you know, we're unified rebels. You're showing divisions coming together that is beautifully exemplified in Saw's angry speech about all the different factions. And it's it's great that you did it like that rather than showing like, oh yeah, we're just all going to be rebels together and it's just that easy. All you got to do is say the words. So so talk about the integration of Saw and showing this, this 
fracturing, possibly, hopefully, slowly coming together. Well, we, I mean, God, we, we were like, okay, who can we get back this year, and who will we get back? And you know, legacy characters. So uh, Forrest is really, you know, ultimately a good time in Rogue. Is always just so exciting to put on screen, and we wanted to kind of max out our our Forrest if we could. And oh my God, who do you want to have have a scene with? Well, I mean, uh, there's very few people you can have a scene with canonically in the story. So Luthen's the perfect one. It also fits very much, as I said, if you think of Luthen as a guy who's been building a machine in his garage privately for 10, 15 years, building this revolution, all these networks and all these relationships, and now having to go public, what that means. And then also on a macro level, what we're, what we'll be watching, because people know at the end in Rogue that Saw Gerrera is four years later from this is, is going to be even more on the outs with the, what becomes the alliance. Sure. Right. Yavin. So I don't think I'm giving much away by saying we'll be very much dealing over time with that element of how hard it is to scale up something that's small, a startup company in a way. And, and my God, if you think of it where security and paranoia and, and identity and everything, you're just vulnerable all the time. How do you get big and stay a secret? How do you pull all your people together and not let everybody know who you are? How do you do those things and the tension of that? What happens to these original gangsters along the way is be something that we'll really be leaning into. Um, that's the first thing, I guess. And there's nothing else I was going to say about Saw. Oh, I, I mean, just people getting along as a bore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I really meant. People getting along as a bore. Yeah. It, it is. It is. You have to have conflict. That's good yeah. drama. And and fascism in its in its roots and its early stages always wants to divide and conquer. They want to be the single unitary force out there, and they want everyone else to be scattered, divided, conquered, so that they're easier to control. So it's good to see this fractured community coming together, and most importantly, having distrust for each other because that. That meeting with Son Luthen was just perfectly written. It was, it was, it was so great. There's going to be a monologue in the next episode, a big monologue from Luthen, a very important speech that he'll give. And when you see it, if you play back to this conversation, he's not gaming, he's not performing, he's telling the truth. He really is. He needs to convince somebody to stick around and do the job, and he really lays out his worldview. And I think when you see that and package it back to to what he does with Saw and then and then playing forward as we go. Luthen is no less conflicted than anybody else in this show. In, in a way, Clea is kind of his backbone. I mean, Clea is really the, the minder of his passion in a way, which I've never thought about before until just right now. But that is that is the case. She's she she seems to be or pretends to be the least conflicted. Um, but he's really conflicted and, and his problems will grow as the show goes on. Right. And she makes him cut the signal. So, I mean, you know, he right. was hesitant. She needed to steal. He, yeah, he needed he needed to take the Band-Aid off and she had him do it. Ooh, hey, kids, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you that Backstory just turned 10. That's right. We've made it a decade. We're here. We've survived and we couldn't have done it without your help. And, uh, you know, we want to keep doing it. So your support means everything to us. If you've never read us before, you could, of course, test drive us by reading the free issue which you could find at Backstory.net on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And uh, look, after you check us out and test drive us, I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber. And just to sweeten the deal, I want to offer you discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. All you got to do is enter that code at Backstory.net and it'll get you access to both the iPad login and over at Backstory.net on a desktop or laptop as well. Look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of all these Zoom casts. That's right. You could watch us do these interviews because they were Zooms that I've put on YouTube on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. It would really mean a lot to me to have you support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. But now let's jump right back into our conversation with showrunner and writer Tony Gilroy about Andor season one, episodes five through nine on Disney Plus. You know, look, you're running a tight writer's room. Everybody needs a chance to do their episodes. These episodes five through nine, it was Steven, it was Dan, it was Bo, and they're and they're perfect. And and obviously you're making the decisions together. Folks are going off on their own. You have a lot of pages to cover. In these next couple episodes, do you come back? I, I'm guessing you wrote the finale, if I had to guess. Are, do you, are there episodes? Yeah, but it doesn't really work that way, Jeff. I mean, that's not how these rooms and these shows work. I mean, I worked with Bo on cards for two years. And, like, 
I remember giving notes on something and thinking on a script because I was hired as a classroom asshole. I was like the person who was supposed to be the final critique of all this stuff. And so to be as nasty and mean as I possibly could. And I think one of the early scripts that came in, I read it and I wrote some brutally unpleasant notes for something and sent it off at midnight and got up and you know, three o'clock in the morning, I went, oh my God, what did I do? I don't even know this writer, this young writer, what am I going to say? And I think I got up and wrote to Bo at like four o'clock in the morning. Oh, dude, do not send this to to uh, to him or her, whoever it was. And, and Bo wrote me back because he's awake all night long. He wrote back goes, don't have to worry about anything. He goes, by the time it gets to you, it's come through me. So you're criticizing me. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. In the end, you know, no show without, I mean, the room and the scripts and like, oh my God, the plotting of this and like the, the, the ability to call these guys up all the time. And do, but like they were done and I was left, you know, we can't afford to keep them on and they sure. have other things to do. And like, it all ends up filtering back through the big machine before it, before it goes out. So I don't really feel any, um, I don't, I don't feel like oh, this is my episode or that's my episode. I kind of have the last say as everything goes through. Ultimately, yeah. I think all shows run that way. I think they I'm all just run. curious if you wrote the finale. You know, like if I wrote the last uh, the last two episodes, I yes, I am the credited writer of the last the credited writer. But at, at, of course, it really is a group effort because you guys yeah. have mapped out everything so well that it just. And I don't know how other people I've heard all kinds of stories about how other people credit these shows and what they do. It just seems all really sloppy and unpleasant to yeah. me. So, it's, you know what? This is clean and good. And it also means that I could like if I want to call Bo up about something that happened in Danny's episode or that I don't have any. There's no I don't have to worry about it. But there is a unified, in the end, it has to come through here. So I don't think of it that way. I think that's true for every show. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's unique to me. Here's like kind of a sensitive question, but I think it's just really important. We're days away from a really important election here in the United States. This show has serious political messages and undertones in it. George Lucas himself was writing against things that he did not like in the Republican Party with the original film that we all fell in love with. And you're writing this for a multinational corporation, Disney, of course. And, you know, it came down in April of 2022 that Politico had an article showing that Disney donated $125,000 to the Florida Republican Party and $65,000 to a Florida Republican committee that helps elect senators. And this was all kind of coming to political action in the Disney company itself when after the don't say gay bill was released employees were like we're giving money to who what are we doing and of course it's sensitive because Orlando has Disney World and this is after you know some of these Republicans were supporters of the January 6th insurrection I'm curious if you were ever told to tone down some of the politics and what it was like because We have a very important election in this country that, in my opinion, is about stopping the creep of fascism or fascistic tendencies. And that is exactly what this show is about. So I am just curious. It's almost like a miracle you were able to get as much through as you could, because I'm sure you've seen the comments online. There's a lot of people that are connecting the dots between our world today and the creeping fascism and the world that you're depicting. Well, you packed a lot of shit in there. Um, I don't. (laughs) Were there notes? No. Was was there any directing to Tony? No, no, never, never, never. But I don't need them because, I mean, and I'm not being fancy by saying, A, I don't start anything with any kind of agenda, political or anything else. I didn't start Clayton by going, oh, I really want to go after, you know, Monsanto and General Motors. I didn't, that couldn't be farther from my mind. My is like, oh my God, what about this guy who's a, what about a guy who's a fixer and what if he drives past the exit lane of redemption and what happens? About, that's where I go. I don't start this show by going, oh, my God, I got to get my I got to get my some political agenda into the show I, at all. But there's all this 50,000 feet look down. I'm two inches off the ground all the time. And I'm just going and going and going. Now, I have my own personal political beliefs, and they're probably not too difficult to figure out what they are. But they do not in any way. The cool thing about this, the, the one of the big attractions about this is to be, you know, I'm a old fucking white guy. So what am I interested in? I'm interested in history and history podcasts. And for 20 years, I've been a DIY history buff. And I read about all kinds of revolutions. And I've been reading about, you know, and I love the history of the revolutions podcasts and Dan Carlin and all the books of Russian revolution that I have and the Haitian revolution and the Roman revolution. You go back. You can go back all the way through recorded history. 
You can find racism, you find slavery, you find oppression, you find torture, you find colonialism, you find every single thing that you could possibly want. And I can go back all the way through history in this show, and I can needle drop all different things that I thought were fascinating all the way down the line. All these different places where as we just talked to before about Stalin, right? Stalin and the funding of other of the urge to make this contemporary and to find contemporary comps for this is, I think it's freaking fascinating. I'm, I love watching the conversations and the arguments. It is not something that we're sitting in the room or I'm sitting in my place going like, Oh, well, this will, this will help swing the, uh, the Wisconsin primary. I don't ever think that way. These are hopefully really universal issues. And I really wonder if you took this show, if there was any context for it, and you dropped it back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and you put it in front of an audience that was dealing with what was in their lives, everybody would find a comp for it. Look, you're right. You will always find a comp for it. Fascism has always existed. Exactly. The the concept of the slow choke is incredibly relevant, in my opinion, to the times we're living in now. But we've been there before, unfortunately. I saw somebody the other day, a fascinating dialectical conversation about accelerationism. You know what accelerationism is? That's what Luthen's attitude is. Oh, my God, I have to burn down the east end of the city so that those people get are homeless and then they'll reach. You know, it's, 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 it's activating people by making things worse. Right. So I just intuitively I didn't even know the term accelerationist until about a month ago. I never heard it before. But. That's what it is. I watch a conversation take place online where people are arguing between right wing accelerationism and left wing accelerationism and the dialectical philosophies of two different completely opposed people. I mean, it's a game I don't want to play. It doesn't help me out. And it's also it's also the truth. I'll I'll say what Susan says. You love me because I'm a mirror and I show you what you need to see. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to get pinned down by that. I I understand you don't. We have an election Tuesday. I'm hoping people vote and also read between the lines. So speaking of fascism, that brings us to the ISB, you know, Deidre and Cyril and Deidre's techniques and just, again, incredible mechanizations in those scenes. Absolutely astounding. I could talk a lot about it. I want to boil it down to one thing. We see the torture droid in the first movie. There's needles. Here, you chose a different path that was great in which it was psychological torture. And we don't see you know, the torture device as being something that's dangerous, you know, that that is a sharp object or a blunt object. Or bore gullets. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. And so how did you arrive at, at, at and what were some of your choices that you had for this torture device that really when it's decoded is possibly the screams of dying children that were also rebels that are having this bad effect? It's kind of the same thing as the prison thing where you it's just like you put the prison on the table in front of the three of us and it's just, well... If we're going to do a prison, it can't be like any other because we we've seen a thousand brilliant prison movies and right. these great prisons. It has to be some. If we can't do something new and completely different, we're not doing it. If we can't find a way to do something really revolutionary and disruptive and and completely fresh, then we won't do it. We have to find a way. That's always the mandate on all this stuff. If we can't come up with the eye of Aldani, then we're not going to do it. There has to be something really new and different about it. So we got to that site. It's like, okay, what, 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 what is torture? What, what, what could we do? Again, that was a room conversation. And I, again, short of a, of a like a annotated transcript, I don't know how you would find out where exactly what the genesis of that was, but it was, it, it was the drive for freshness, really. What else can we do? And then we experimented with, you know, I remember going into a mix and a rough mix where, you know, Skywalker had, uh, you know, because they always try to do a great job, but they put some they put some sounds way back in the phones. You could almost sort of hear. It. I was like, "Dog, can't have anything. Can't have anything. You can never right, put anything." Here. And by the way, for the prison, unfortunately, we live in a in a society that has privatized prisons, and they need new customers. They need new clients. So having a prison where you're showing that you're getting further in debt sometimes, and that you're being forced to work in a corporate culture, and sure, you could say, "Oh, there's no doors," but you can't leave your cell because of the hot floors, which is just this great concept. And so, I mean, that was that was fascinating as well. If this is somewhat a conversation about when I'm being thematic and when I'm being detailed, there is something thematic in the prison in a small way, in a character way for, for Andy Serkis's character, for Kino, because that's not about politics. That's about that's really about religion in a, in a fundamental way, because, you know, for him, the afterlife is to get out, is to be free. I only have a certain number of days and I'm going to I'm going to move on to the you know, if I get my 217 shifts, I'm going to get out of here. So he's a believer. 
he ha- he believes in that afterlife. He really has faith. It's the it's he's he's committed his every all of his faith goes to that idea. And what happens when faith is destroyed? And you watch his faith destroyed. It's not a political exercise for him. It's really much more fundamental in that he's lost his theology, really, in a way. Right. And he decides to pick up on another drive, you know, as, as a way to get out of the prison. You yeah. know, for what happened on level two, that could have been an interesting conversation of seeing seeds of discontent down there and stuff like that. But it really seems like a clerical error of sending someone to the wrong floor and having the wrong count. What were some of the ideas that you played with for what happened for this whole floor to be eliminated and the realization that no one actually is getting out of this prison? They're going to be worked to death and that there is really no escape. Trying to get the prison down, that was a lot of really complicated plotting and it went through, we did all the stuff that we did in the room and then there was another iteration of it afterwards. A lot of conversations with Bo even after he left and then in the end it really, that was one of the very last things to be figured out. We're very conscious early on, you're you're searching, what are you searching for? You you know, you go to all your early meetings with your, with your directors and your camera department and your thing and what kind of lenses are we going to use and what's our look and what's our, what, how are we going to shoot it and what kind of what kind of what's our what's our vibe about shooting and and you have all these you know specific and theoretical conversations about all that stuff and you know 40 percent of it is really valuable the same time as you go along you develop a grammar for your show and our show has a grammar it has a bunch of different aspects to it a grammar for time and a grammar for time of day and a grammar for how we arrive in scenes and our grammar doesn't allow us to go down to level two and see that. Like that's not in our POV. That's not in our, that would violate our, as wide as we are, we don't have anybody down there. We're not there. I actually, I actually meant it coming maybe even from the sign language, but how much could you get across? So, I mean, like you had to shorthand it and you had exactly the right amount of time, but that's tricky to have the seeds for revolution. In these yeah, but you know what, they, but I tell you what happened. The doctor tells you what happened now. Yeah. I thought you meant, to, why didn't we show it? Or was we tempted to show it? There was a moment where I was like so desperate to figure out what the fuck happened down there that I was actually going to show it. But uh, it, it, it just, I think I may have started that and sketched it for a little while. I'm like, oh God, this just doesn't feel right. That makes sense. Well, so out of the axe forgets, the I announcement, Narkina five and nobody's listening. What do you remember as the toughest scene? The toughest element to grapple with on the page, not really a logistics on the set, but the toughest thing to grapple with on the page. Honestly, the many versions of plotting the prison okay, and, and trying to get the prison, man, oh man, see what happens is on our show, because everything is designed. And I think we talked about this last time, how we have to design everything that we do as we're writing it. The actual layout schematic, how the prison works and where the contract, how many guys are there and what that balcony lever thing does. And it's like getting into all that stuff, which sounds so inchy pinchy and small and mechanical and non-glamorous, and it isn't, but that's all the key to finding enough ammo for Cassie and after 30 days to have figured out what to do. And then I think the biggest revelation in the whole thing was saying, you know what? They're afraid. I think when Cassian says, you know what? You don't, you, that lot, that one line, you know, he says, oh, they're, they're powerful. And, and Cassian says to him, that's not power. Oh, that's actually coming up in the next episode. I guess he, he says, it's not power. You know, these people are afraid and they're afraid because they don't have enough people. But if we wait until tomorrow, if we wait another day, we're never going to get a chance. Yeah. And that idea allowed me to condense a lot of things together and, and build it out. And, and that was that was that was very difficult. That Because the prison it just wants to go sprawl out. It wants to be stuck there forever. Well, having not seen the episode, I like that that kind of mysterious way of putting it in which it's time based. So you have a ticking clock and I can't wait to see episode 10. You, you have been very generous with your time as usual. I look forward to talking to you after the finale. Thank All you right. so much again for, for hanging out. Thanks for your support, Jeff. Thank you very much, man. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to showrunner and writer Tony Gilroy for being such a stand-up fella and coming down to chat with us about Andor Season 1, Episodes 5 through 9 on Disney+. Plus. We're getting right to the end, folks, and wow, I cannot wait to see how this season concludes. Of course, while you're surfing around online, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine. We just turned 10, folks. We we lasted a decade, and we couldn't have done it without your support. So it would be fantastic to have you as a subscriber. And of course, to sweeten the deal, if you want to subscribe now, you could use discount coupon code 
SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory. You just enter that code into the shopping cart at Backstory.net, and it will give you access to both the iPad app and the website. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom casts go. That's right. These are Zoom interviews. So you could watch us have these discussions on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. It would really mean a lot to me to have you consider supporting my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2022 all rights reserved. Folks, if you want to find me on social media, you could always find me as Yo Goldsmith on Twitter or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter. You could also find those same accounts on Instagram. So Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. You could check out our Facebook fan page or you could even send us an email at BackstoryLetters at gmail.com. That inbox gets a little cluttered sometimes. So I apologize if I don't respond immediately, but I love hearing what folks have to say. And I promise you, I will do my darndest to get to your message. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.